as we've been talking about eternal things this uh, series i want to talk today about the beatitudes in hell the uh, the image behind me here is that of a smashed piano i think you'll pick up on why i'm talking about that but uh, the uh, <clears throat> sermon on the mount Matthew chapter five, six, and seven is uh, the Jesus explaining the objectives of his kingdom to his people. It's the first uh, recorded sermon after his opening message, which was just simply repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, Matthew five, one, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so he begins describing the kingdom of heaven with this, uh, this verse, the opening line there, which we will start with today. Uh, the Beatitudes are called the Beatitudes. It, be, it comes from a Latin word meaning blessing, which uh, each of these eight uh, characteristics that Jesus describes begin with that word, blessed. Or blessed, and there is uh, no language connection between the word beatitudes and the phrase beautiful attitudes. But I really think that nicely sums up what they are. They uh, they give a complete picture of the character of Christ, and they explain how our hearts ought to look also. So God help us as we look into those today. Um, now, in the piano behind me here, there are eight main notes in a typical Western-based octave, you know, do, re, mi, fa, lo, so, la, so, ti, da, something like that. Uh, and then it starts over and keeps repeating the octave eight for octave, the eight notes that uh, repeat up and down the keyboard, a total of 11 times. There's 88 keys on a typical piano in case you need that trivia question. But uh, every melody line, every chord is based on those, those seven named notes that keep repeating over and over. The first and last note in an octave is repeated, uh, obviously up higher at the one end than the other. But I uh, think of the Beatitudes as the music notes of the kingdom. There's a rich variety of expressions of character that are all, but they're all rooted in these basics. And so uh, let's go back to middle C today, the starting point in this particular scale. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus right off the bat starts out attacking the issue of pride. Uh, pride rhymes with hide and pride makes cowards out, cowards out of us and makes liars out of us because we don't want anybody to know how bad we are, how inadequate, how sinful. And, and how empty, and so we hide, pretending to be other, something other than what we really are. Well, Jesus said there's a blessing to being poor in spirit, where you recognize and admit your own inadequacy. Uh, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, that says, We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. The, the giving of the original covenant, the Old Testament was spectacular. The mountain was shaking and Moses' face glowed so much when he came down from the mountain, he had to put a veil over it to protect the people from looking upon him. But there's a hint here in this verse that he kept wearing the veil, not to protect the people from the glory of his face, but because that glory was fading and maybe he didn't want them to realize it. John Fisher in 1975, wrote a, a, a song called Evangelical Veil Productions, which uh, was kind of based on that. It says, Evangelical Veil Productions pick run up now at quite a reduction. Got all kinds of shapes and sizes, introductory bonus prizes, special quality one way see through. You can see them, but they can't see you. Oh, you never have to show yourself again. <laughs> and that's what people have been doing. We've got our mask now with the virus situation and we can hide some things behind that. But, uh, but there is a tendency of us 
because we don't want people to know. We don't even want to admit to God our, our great need. We don't want to admit and recognize even that we need a savior. That's the starting point. The kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of God belongs to the poor in spirit. And so, uh, you know, pride makes you tired. You got to put up an image. You got to hope nobody finds out what you're really like. Uh, one of the great things about poorness of spirit is means you can just admit your weakness and vulnerability. And, and that is so relaxing. I don't have to to, to be a fake anymore. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. And the pilgrims, as we approach Thanksgiving weekend pretty soon here, the pilgrims began their journey on their knees and they ended their journey in America kneeling before God on their knees. Uh, they took seriously the promise of the kingdom of heaven is those who are poor in spirit. All the resources of God are available. That's what that means. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. Verse 7 says, for you are my hiding place. Notice, he stopped trying to hide his guilt. He said, God, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. And so we come, when we enter the kingdom that way. We say, I need a savior. Uh, and I think that these the attitudes, as I've studied them through the years, I discovered something that I believe that each of these attitudes is going to be demonstrated either in this life, in heaven, or it's going to be demonstrated in hell. But it's not going to be accompanied by a blessing in hell. Uh, you know, in hell, there's going to be no pride. There's going to be nobody wearing masks. There's no makeup. There's no macho, macho man in hell. Everybody is saying, help I admit my need, but it's going to be too late then. I, uh, I think that there is going to be the greatest prayer meeting ever in the history of civilization is going to be in hell, people crying out to God. Uh, but uh, back to the piano. You know, God tickles the ivories uh, in our lives, pounding on the, for instance, the poor in spirit key by tapping us in some way that will test our pride. <laughs> and if we respond well, it resonates in his heart throughout the kingdom and then blessing is released. Uh, but in hell, when that key is tapped, when poorness of spirit is admitted and recognized, uh, it'll be too late. It'll be useless, the concert's over piano is smashed. Uh, it's never going to make music again. It's crashed off the cliff and it's beyond the repair. There was a lady in Canada recently in the last year that uh, the movers dropped her $200,000 piano, grand piano that it, she'd had for 17 years and just made her heart sick, uh, but it was beyond repair. The guy that who had built it by hand looked at it and said, it's not salvageable, junk it. And that's kind of what's in heaven. There won't be any resonation when God strikes the keys of our hearts and we say, yes, we respond, it's too late. Yeah, we'll be poor in spirit, but there's no blessing that the kingdom of heaven is ours. You can tap on it, uh, pound on it however long you want, strike that key, but it's not... Uh, connected, the soundboard is cracked, the, the strings are broken, the hammer mechanism is disconnected, and it's just going to make a, a heart sick tap, tap, tap. Well, the next beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is talking about people that grieve over their sinfulness, not just the fact they got caught, but I, I am a mess. I am messed up. And, uh, they have a heart that's tender before God. Second Samuel 24, 10 says, David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David was a messed up sinner. Uh, time and again, we read about the mistakes he made, but yet his heart smote him. Uh, he, he was tenderhearted. Uh, he grieved over his sin, and, and he didn't, uh, didn't excuse it. He didn't blame somebody else, but he experienced remorse, remorse and regret. He didn't try to 
hide uh, and avoid the guilt, uh, but he experienced it. He felt it. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He points us. He makes us miserable <laughs> until we come to that place of admitting, of confessing. He is the convictor, but he is also the comforter. There's always uh, that place where God is calling us to himself. Uh, but we go the other way when we refuse to grieve over our sin, we begin to become hardened. Ephesians 4.18 says they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. They become callous, have given themselves up to sensuality, uh, uh, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's... Uh, that's what it's going to be in hell, the people that have hardened their hearts. They've calloused their hearts. But I believe there's going to come a burning away of those calluses. I believe the people that have been desensitized to sin, things that they once recoiled at, and now have come to accept and finally embrace and even celebrate that they're going to return to that tenderness of conscience in hell and admit, realize I was wrong, and they will grieve in hell where it's too late to do anything about it. Romans 1.32 says, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things to de deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Uh, they applaud, they cheer on people that are doing perverse uh, and wicked things. You know, in hell, there's going to be no Mardi Gras parades. <laughs> there's going to be no reveling in sin, no lewdness, and no cheering crowds uh, saying, yeah, that's great. Uh, affirming rebellion against God, celebrating everything that's appealing to and indulging the flesh. It's not going to happen in heaven. Uh, the beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, that's going to be fulfilled there. Uh, shame and guilt are going to abound in hell, but tap, tap, tap on the broken Piano, the keyboard for, for uh, remorse, for guilt, for grieving. It's not going to do any good. There's going to be no music that comes forth. Job said, after he encountered God, he said, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. There will be a lot of despising of self, of contempt of self, even in hell, but there's no place for repentance and return to God. Matthew 5.5, 5, the third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, uh, the issue there is the human will, self-will. I want my way. I want my personal rights. I get angry if I'm frustrated from achieving my goals, if what I want to happen doesn't happen. Uh, meekness means that I, I feel like I deserve better. I demand respect. I want some recognition. I, I want some appreciation. I expect God to do this, and I expect God to do that. And if he doesn't, then I won't serve him, you know, since he won't serve me. Uh, we accuse God of wrongdoing. Jeremiah 18, the, the, one of the chapters that talks about the potter and the wheel, but it, this is the expression of the people's hearts there. We will follow our own plans, and we uh, will every one act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. We're just going to do our thing. C.S. Lewis said there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Frank Sinatra is famous for song called I Did It My Way. For what is man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say all the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows, but I did it my way. Well, there's something to be said for individuality in this life, and we're not all cookie cutters, but when it comes to doing it our way, when God is telling us a different way, I think that might be the theme song of hell. I, I don't know if Frank is in heaven or hell today, but if he's in the wrong place, I suspect that that song is playing over and over. I did it my way. 
there will be a bowing of people's will, a recognition. Really, meekness comes as a result of seeing how good God is, how wise he is, how caring. And we entrust our lives, our decisions to him. But uh, someday, everybody is going to see that and recognize it. And it says in Philippians 2.10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, this beatitude in hell will be realized, but it's on the broken piano, remember. Tap, tap, tap. Yes, meekness. I acknowledge your greatness and your glory. I don't think it's going to be an unwilling submission. I think it's going to be an awestruck. Yes, God, you are worthy. Every knee should bow. Every tongue confess that you are Lord. And they, you know, the Bible says, you believe there's one God. Uh, that's nice, but so do the demons in hell, and they tremble. Uh, it's too late at this point uh, for there to be any blessing. The blessing of those that are meek, they will inherit the earth. God will provide for them. They don't have to strive and strain. God will watch out for them. Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9, 27, then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. That's going to be re repeated, I believe, by every soul in hell. God, you were right, and I am wrong. Well, the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. There's going to be a hungering and thirsting for righteousness in hell like has never been experienced here on this earth. Uh, there was a woman that Jesus met, a sinful woman at the well, and he said in John 4, 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The lady had, had five husbands living with another man and just seeking to find the, the emotional hole in her heart, a spiritual hole really is what it was. And, Jesus said, all the wells of this world are going to leave you empty and dry. Uh, I have a well to drink from that you'll never thirst again. That doesn't mean you won't continue to have a desire. Uh, if you live in the middle of a desert, somebody drills a well in the sand and says, you're never going to thirst again. Hallelujah. I found <laughs> what I need. Uh, I know where to go. I'm not going to be lacking. And, and so that's what it is that Jesus is speaking of here and really uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness some people might think well that's a uh, desire to always do what's right and and the legal type things and, and uh, there needs to be that in our lives but really there's no satisfaction that comes from just keeping the law Paul was the legalistic Pharisee He'd done everything uh, the right way but he was still empty uh, until he finally discovered he really what he really really needed was found in he says in Philippians 3 9 I want to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him Paul said I I put an end to my emptiness I, I met a person I had an encounter with Jesus uh, I discovered his love and care for me. I'm, I've, I want to be found in him. People in, in hell are lost for eternity. I want to be found uh, like an orphan child that's longing for, for love. It's not just I want a place. I want just the outward things. I want, I want to be loved. Uh, someone has said that loneliness is God's cry for friendship with you. Heaven is a place of fellowship with God, with others. Hell is a place of separation. Uh, you tell God, I want you to leave me alone. He says, okay, I will. Second Thessalonians 1.9, they will suffer their punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And they say, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty for righteousness. I want that relationship. I want to I want to be a good person. Tap, tap, tap. The beatitude is sounding on the broken keyboard of the smashed piano, but it's not going to receive the blessing. It's too late. The fifth beatitude. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I think, you know, people that go to hell are not just totally bad people. They, we read, uh, you know, people that have done great things and, and uh, all that, but people that just have rejected Christ, have uh, not believed in him, have not been poor in spirit, have tried to be self-sufficient and work their way into, into uh, heaven. But the hell is not going to be populated just with outright wicked people. There is a story that we read last time about the rich men in hell, in Hades, Luke 16, 27. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Apparently, this man still cared about people, but he couldn't do anything to help them. He said, please send Lazarus over there in Abraham's bosom. Maybe he could go back and, and, and tell them and warn them to come. He cared. What a terrible thing it is to to see people in need and, and you want to help them and you can't help them. Uh, have you ever been in a, in a hospital where there's people that are, somebody in the room just keeps crying out in agony or in a, in a nursing home, a convalescent center where there's somebody just crying and uh, you look, you know, I, I cry out, uh, our cats capture birds and mice and bring them in half maimed and I'm trying to decide do I, finish him off with decapitate him with a shovel or try and set him over the fence and just hope they'll survive. But, you know, my heart grieves. Think what it's going to be like in heaven to hear all the grieving, billions of people in torment around about you. And you say, God, yeah, I, I, I want to hear their cry. I hear their cries for mercy. I want to do something about it now. And he says, well, what about all the people that needed mercy when you were there? Why didn't you do that? Uh, there's, there's just uh, really a, a terrible, you can never tell somebody in hell, well, it's going to get better. You know it's not going to get better. And whatever desires you suppressed in this life, uh, it's not going to do any good in heaven. Tap, 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 hitting on that key. I, God, I, I, I see these needs and I want to meet them. Uh, and, and God says, no, he wouldn't give mercy there. And you're not going to receive mercy either. The promise here is that those merciful will receive mercy. Luke 16, 24, that rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. But it never happens. There's no blessing. There will be the hard attitude wanting to extend mercy, but no ability to do it, no receiving of mercy for yourself. Next beatitude says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, how can that be fulfilled in hell? Pure in heart? Uh, well, it won't be in the one sense. Those that are in hell will remain sinful for all eternity. Uh, their character will not improve. You know, we always think, well, I can get better. I'm going to improve, but in hell, we'll know it's never going to happen. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 11, the last book of the Bible, let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Uh, people are going to enter into heaven purified in heart. People enter hell putrefied in heart. And they will continue putrefied in heart, sadly. Isaiah 14, 11 told of a, a king entering death, the grave. It says, your, your pomp is brought down to Sheol. The sound of your harps, maggots are laid as a bed beneath you. And the worms are your covering. Well, in this life, maggots, uh, if I may read a little article, I, I uh, Research here, maggots are efficient consumers of dead tissue. They munch on rotting flesh, leaving healthy tissue practically unscathed. Physicians in Napoleon's army used the larvae to, to, use the larvae to clean wounds. In World War I, American surgeon William Baer noticed that soldiers with maggot-infested gashes didn't have the expected infection or swelling seen in other patients. 
In 2004, the US Food and Drug Administration approved maggot therapy as a prescription treatment. In hell, Jesus said in Mark 9, 48, better to enter heaven with one hand, one eye, than to enter hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Heaven, hell is gonna be filled with maggots that never cleanse the wounds. It's gonna be a fire that burns, but it never purifies. Uh, it's not a place where people are reformed, but it's a place where people are punished. Uh, but yet, how could this be fulfilled, the beatitude, the, how would anybody be pure in heart in hell? Well, the word pure, Greek word katharos, describes purification by cleansing from filth, but it also means without dilution. Uh, orange juice and apple juice mixed together may be even pure and clean individually, but they're mixed together, they're diluted. Uh, so pure in heart can refer to having an undivided heart, an undiluted heart, undiluted, a heart that has the proper priorities, the things that really matter are refined down and the focus my time and energy is on the things that are most important. Well, in eternity, there will be no distractions from the great issue of what is important and the relationship with God and righteousness. That is going to be non-existent except in the wishes and the hopes of the people. And they may say, God, I'm pure in heart. I got it figured out. I got my priorities straight now. Well, sadly, it's too late. The pure in heart will see God on this side, but in there, they never will. Next beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Hell is gonna be a place without peace. And if you're there, you're gonna long for peace. I hope nobody that I'm speaking to today is gonna to ever be there, but people in hell will be a place without peace. Isaiah 57, 20 says, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up uh, mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. It's going to be a place where you would long for peace. You would want to be a peacemaker. You would have a heart that says, let's, let's uh, bring things to some solution here, but uh, it's not going to happen. Remember? who hell was prepared for, the devil and his angels, and who's gonna be there is not just the human race, it's the devil and his angels that have tormented, that have brought fear and condemnation and guilt, they're still gonna be there and probably still doing their work. Disruption and division and everything else. James three, uh, verse six says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set, uh, is set among our members, uh, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of fire, and is set on fire by hell. That's the characteristic of Satan, the, the tongue. Uh, that's where disruption and, and uh, prejudice and all the quarrels and arguing, arguing in this world have their origination. Well, at least should, I should say they're helped along by that. We have enough in our own flesh probably to do without that, but the next James 3, 14 says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. In hell, I think demons are gonna keep doing what they do here, unhindered by God, stirring up bitterness, hatred, prejudice, suspicion, guilt, shame, condemnation, uh, fear, paranoia. Uh, it, it's going to be a miserable place to be. And if there's anything you could do to solve that for yourself or anybody else, I'm sure you would long to be a peacemaker. You'd do anything you could. Uh, you know, torment and anguish amplify the, the level of frustration. Uh, I remember being in a convalescent center when I heard a man just screaming in anguish. And I didn't know if he'd fallen and broken his hip or what. He was cursing at the nurses and attendants there. And I thought, what, what is his problem? So I 
I investigated a little bit. I found out what it was. His oatmeal was cold. That was, uh, but he was in such a state of surrounded by his other things that that just was the end of the world for him. I can just imagine what it's going to be like in hell. Uh, the complaints, the bitterness, the hatred, and the things that are stirred up there. Uh, peace is God. Peace with God is what's needed, but it's an opportunity that's passed. And uh, tap, 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 God, I want to, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be called a child of God. I want to bear your family resemblance. Uh, God, I know you came to bring peace between God and man to reconcile. I want to be a part of that. I want to get these people out of here. I want to get out myself. I want to be in this place. Who, you know, who wants to be in a family or any other situation it's just continually filled with strife and bickering and arguing. Well, welcome to hell. The next beatitude and the the last one, in fact, blessed are those who are per persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you're not going to be in hell be because you're being persecuted for doing what's right, but you will have the hard attitude that underlies anyone that's being persecuted for righteousness sake and standing up to it in this life. You know, this uh, we come full circle here, the full octave, the, the first promise, the those that are poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The last one, those that are persecuted for righteousness sake, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The first one is, I've fallen and I can't get up. The top note in this octave is, I've been raised up and I can't be knocked down. You can't kick me down. You can't intimidate me down. I'm not impressed by anything other than God. I'm unintimidated by any threat to my earthly well-being. Matthew 10, 28 says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. A person that's willing to be persecuted for righteousness sake is somebody that sees beyond the, the brief trials on earth and knows that the, the testings, the, the problems of this earth are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to keep the eternal views in mind. Uh, do you get upset when people make fun of you? Do you get embarrassed? Uh, First Peter 4, verse 4 says, They are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And in fact, the next two verses here in Matthew say, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. Be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Uh, you know, somebody in hell might say, God, I don't care what anybody says. I, I, I would speak up for you. I wouldn't be ashamed of you. I don't care if they laugh at me. I don't care if they, if they torture me. Uh, I don't care. Well, that's the attitude that needs to be in this life. God, I don't care. They slash my tires, if they burn my house, if they graffiti our church, whatever, it's all going to burn. There's a new heavens and new earth. Uh, and uh, that's music in God's ears. Tap, tap, tap. That's what he wants to hear. The note that sounded out. But in hell, tap, tap, tap is not going to result in anything resonating on the soundboard of that piano. It's just emptying, echoing through hell. Well, What's the, what's the result of a life that's lived in tune with God, uh, an instrument that's tuned and, and uh, in proper mechanical order and everything else? Matthew 5.14 follows up the Beatitudes, says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If I may extend the music metaphor today i'd say you are the music in this world in a world filled with disharmony it's out of tune it's it's empty and it's hopeless the songs are songs of despair and loneliness and destruction but we are god's instruments he wants to play a concerto on the keyboard of your life in the, the sound of music uh, 
uh, Julie Andrews teaches the kids a song based on the octave, do, but do, female, dear, Ray, a drop of golden sun. Well, I, I adopted the Beatitudes as the scale, as the do, re, me of the kingdom. And, and uh, I put, uh, <clears throat> put that to, to some adjusted words. And I want to tell that a little in just a minute. But uh, first, uh, before we take a evaluation of tuning up our pianos here today, I, I want to read Ecclesiastes 12.1. It says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the silver cord is snapped, verse six says, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered on the fountain, or the wheel broken on the cistern, the dust returns to earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. You know, it talks about the silver cord snapped, the golden bowl broken. I say before the piano lays crushed at the bottom of that final clip, with the soundboard shattered and the string snapped, and the Hammer mechanisms disconnected from the keyboard. And the only sound that comes out is a desperate little tap, tap, tap echoing through the, the halls of hell. It's too late. Is it tune up time, restringing time? Do you need to repair some mechanisms? Well, uh, poor in spirit, I cry help. Tune up time here. I need help. God, I admit my need. If you're an unbeliever today, in the pride of your heart, you said, I don't need a Savior, I'm good enough. Uh, pray with me right now, God, I've fallen and I can't get up. I need help and I believe that you can help me. And so I, I reach out, I believe you can cleanse me, I believe you can direct me and I need help and I respond to the offer of mercy and grace. And this time, let, uh, call upon the Lord while he may be found. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. To our God, and he will abundantly pardon, Isaiah 55 says. Uh, the uh, second note that God hits there wants to hear, are you grieving? When we say, God, I am sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm going to say no. Uh, grieving ones cry out, oh no, no, I don't. That's not how it should be, and I grieve over it. Uh, the next key on the piano is meekness there. Make one's trust and tell God, yes. God, I believe that you know more than I do. I believe that you're trustworthy. I will obey you. That's the measure of our maturity. How much, how far will I go before I say to God, no? Uh, the fourth key on the piano here, the the beatitude that says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hungry, thirsty ones want more, 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 more of Jesus. God, I choose you more than all the temptations of this world. The next key there is blessed are the merciful. They'll obtain mercy. When God strikes that key, is he going to find a heart that says, yes, I'll do something about the need that I see before me, the, the spiritual need, the practical, physical needs. Uh, mercy uh, says, I care, and I want to help you. God, I'll be your hand extended. And then the, the, the attitude of the peacemaker uh, says, God, I'm going to be used of you to restore ruptured, ruptured relationships. I'm going to do what I can to see this racial turmoil in our nation healed. I'm going to do what I can to see family members that are at odds with one another, husbands and wives that are headed for divorce, kids that hate their parents and turn back. That's God, yes, tune me up, restore the things in me that need to be restored, but use me as an instrument. And then the last one, are you afraid of people? Uh, persecuted ones cry, so what? What are you gonna do to me? It's all going to be temporary anyhow. I'm looking for a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, so God help us today as we, as we examine our hearts and our lives. And just, I don't want to imagine what it's going to be like in hell. There won't be any music, just the, that uh, banging on the broken keyboard. Well, let's finish up with a few lines from a great song. Lord, make me. 
an instrument, Lord, tune me, an instrument, Lord, use me, an instrument, an instrument of worship, I lift up my hands in 